Detroit has been through hell and back on more than one occasion. Often ranked as the most dangerous city in America, Detroit has its fair share of problems and a pretty bad reputation on the world stage. That being said, we all owe this uniquely beautiful city a debt of gratitude. Not for the incredible music produced there in the 60s or even all the cars it has made, but for what it did during the Second World War. Its contributions to the war effort led to the Allied victory. In this video, we're going to discuss how the people of Detroit used industrial infrastructure to transform the city from the Motor City to the arsenal of democracy. Detroit's auto industry began in 1899 when Henry Ford established the Detroit Automobile Company, which produced two cars in three years and ultimately crashed and burned. That same year, Ransom E. Olds opened the first auto manufacturing plant in the city, only to be followed by Ford, who established his second car company, the Henry Ford Co., two years later. After that, William Durant and Charles Stuart Mott created General Motors in 1908, and Walter Chrysler established the Chrysler Corporation in 1925. Automobiles became the primary industry in the city, and together, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler became known as the Big Three. Detroit isn't called the Motor City for no reason, after all. The Big Three attracted a lot of people to Detroit and its surrounding suburbs, and it didn't take long for the city to become synonymous with industry and opportunity. Though it may be hard to believe now, in the 1920s, Detroit was nicknamed the Paris of the West and was considered one of the most desirable places to live in the country. Between 1900 and 1930, the city's population boomed, going from 285,000 to 1.5 million, making it the fourth largest city in the US at the time. That all came crashing down when the depression hit in the 30s, however. Car sales all but stopped, leading to mass layoffs, and Detroit faced the first of several subsequent downfalls. At that time, no one could have predicted that the thing that would save Detroit from its first major financial crisis would be World War II. In December 1940, when the war was already in full swing across the pond in Europe, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivered one of his famous fireside chats to the nation. During his speech, he expressed his desire for the United States to begin supplying the Allies with as many planes, tanks, and weapons that it could. He already asked Congress on a number of occasions if they could commission the military production. Each time, Congress either said no or came back with a counter-offer that wasn't nearly good enough for FDR. So he turned to the automakers. FDR went to Bill Knudsen, the president of General Motors, and asked him to head up the US military production. Knudsen accepted the job, which paid him a salary of just $1, and lit a fire under everyone's ass when he said this to a group of the biggest automotive executives in the country. The first half of 1941 is crucial. Gentlemen, we must outbuild Hitler. General Motors immediately got to work on converting the auto factories into war factories, but it wasn't as easy as it sounded. The US was somewhat behind Europe in terms of military equipment. At the outbreak of the Second World War, the US Army had just 32 tanks, and they were still putting in orders for cavalry saddles. There was little industrial military standard at the time, and that made it difficult for GM to know what FDR really wanted. There was also somewhat of a political hurdle to overcome as the army and airplane manufacturers didn't want the automakers to produce airplanes because of competition. It wasn't until the Battle of Britain, when the Royal Air Force lost more than 1,200 aircraft, that America comprehended the power of the Luftwaffe. Suddenly, business competition was no longer the most important thing to the American businessmen, and the War Productions Board worked to smooth over disputes about who could produce what. By 1942, GM was a major military contractor. It made everything. Navy fighter planes, artillery shells, trucks, cannons, torpedo bombers, tanks, and much more. The tanks, specifically, were produced in the Cadillac factory, which had once made some of the nation's most luxurious cars. 
But going from luxury cars to war tanks was no big deal for GM, which was directly responsible for $12 billion worth of war production by the time the Germans surrendered in 1945, making the company the largest military contractor in the world. GM produced almost 120 million artillery shells 1.9 million machine and submachine guns, 854,000 trucks, 190,000 cannons, and a whole lot more. No other company or even country could match the amount of war material produced by General Motors. As for Bill Knudsen, GM didn't keep him as president of the company. Not long after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he enlisted in the US Army, where he served as a lieutenant general until the end of the war. Ford jumped into the military contracting game not long after GM in 1942. The company didn't waste any time eating Coney dogs and drinking Vernals. Its employees got straight to work on converting Ford's factories into war factories. Not only that, they also began building brand new factories to expand their production. The most famous factory they built was named Willow Run, which was the largest factory under a single roof in the world. In it, they built B-24 heavy bombers. Also known as Liberators, these planes were the largest the Americans produced during the war. While Ford Motor Company was no longer being run by Henry Ford directly, his son Edsel had his father's passion for innovation. He promised that his company would be able to produce the B-24s at a rate of one per hour. Despite the insistence of aviation experts that it was impossible. Toward the end of the war, Ford achieved his goal and the Willow Run plant was producing as many as 14 B-24s in a single day. In total, the company made over 8,600 of the planes by the war's end. To put that insane figure into perspective, it took four factories between two aviation companies to produce 9,800 Liberators. But Willow Run is not only famous for being a site of innovation, it has also gained fame because of one of its workers. Well, allegedly. Willow Run employed many so-called riveters or worker women. One of these riveters was a young woman by the name of Rose Will Monroe. She worked at the assembly line at Willow Run building bombers. One day at work, she caught the eye of some Hollywood producers visiting the plant and looking for young women to film for a war bond campaign. It's rumored that her part in the film inspired the famous We Can Do It poster. Since this is a history video, we have to mention that there is some debate about where Rosie the Riveter came from. It's not really clear. Despite this, Detroiters claim her as one of their own, including the writer of this video. If the evidence is good enough to be on Ford's official website, then it's good enough for Detroiters. The last company to join the party was Chrysler, who only rocked up after Bill Knudsen called the company's chief executive, K.T. Keller, to ask if he could build tanks. Keller replied, I don't know, I've never seen one of these things. Keller soon began learning about tanks, and a short time later, Chrysler broke ground on the Detroit Arsenal tank plant. The plant had one goal, build as many tanks as possible using the tried and true methods of car manufacturing. It was something that had never been done before, but it worked. Chrysler began producing its M3 tanks before the plant was even finished. After the 1.25 million square foot factory was finished, production was upgraded and they began making M4 Sherman tanks. Instead of creating brand new engines for the 30 cylinder motors, they took five six cylinder car engines and welded them together. These methods allowed them to produce a crap ton of tanks during the war. All told, the Detroit Arsenal built over 25,000 tanks, which was 5,000 more than the Germans. They even set an all-time production record by making 896 M4 tanks in one month in December 1942. But Chrysler's contributions didn't stop at tank production. In 1943, a handful of Chrysler engineers were asked to work on a top-secret project called Project X100. They were told virtually nothing about what it was they were hoping to build, but they knew it must have been extremely important because the FBI patrolled the factory to make sure no information got out. Only the top Chrysler executives knew the engineers were hoping to create the atomic bomb. It was at a laboratory on Detroit's famous Woodward Avenue that Chrysler engineers designed the bomb's gaseous diffusers used for uranium diffusion. 
They were so well designed that one of Chrysler's factories produced 3,500 of them alone, and they were even used in the bomb that detonated over Hiroshima. Detroit's contribution to Allied war production cannot be understated, nor should it be forgotten. Between three companies in a city that was home to just 2% of the country's population, they made billions of bullets, tens of millions of guns, and hundreds of thousands of tanks, planes, and whatever else the military wanted. The Motor City truly was the arsenal of democracy. But what do you think of Detroit's contributions? Do you know of any other cities that were major contributors? Do any of you have family that worked for the Big Three during the war? Please tell us down in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.